All right, uh, moving right along here in Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, we're up to chapter 16. Um, and I just want to focus on that chapter um, for this video. Now, so the Glanton gang is headed north now. They're following the Santa Cruz River, which will eventually lead them uh, to the Gila River, which at this time, before the Gadsden Purchase in 1853, uh, um, was the boundary between Arizona and Mexico. And um, the Gila River then flows, uh, which is part of the Salt River, uh, then flows down uh, and meets the Colorado River um, at Yuma. Um, so the confluence of those two rivers meet there at Yuma, uh, which then the Colorado forms the boundary between California and Arizona, just as the Rio Grande at this time forms the boundary between Texas and Mexico. Um, now these rivers are very important because the Colorado River flows down from the Rockies, um, and there's a little Colorado that flows off it. Where the scene took place, recall, with the judge making gunpowder, um, as Tobin, the ex-priest, recounted it, um, he was making gunpowder near a volcano. And there are, this is, the little Colorado is in northern Arizona, and there are craters there, uh, as well as dormant volcanoes. Uh, the artist James Terrell bought one, a dormant volcano, and he's building uh, a big installation there. So the Colorado then flows all the way down into the Gulf of California. Um, and the Colorado River uh, is absolutely essential for the civilization of the Southwest, which is essentially a riverine civilization, just like the civilizations of the ancient world, the Nile, and in Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates. Um, without the Colorado River, Phoenix would not exist. So Phoenix is a kind of city-state that is riverine and is almost entirely dependent on the Colorado River for its water, as is, uh, to a certain extent, is Los Angeles. Although uh, William Mulholland figured out a sneaky way to build a 200-mile aqueduct uh, to steal water from the Central Valley from farmers and bring it down into Los Angeles, um, which gets most of its water there. Los Angeles then is also a riverine uh, city-state. And uh, uh, Mulholland, by the way, as a footnote, built uh, the St. Francis Dam um, in the 1920s, which was part of this aqueduct, which then collapsed and the water flooded down and drowned an entire town and killed 431 people. Uh, it was Mulholland's biggest failure and he never lived it down. He took it to his grave in shame. Um, so that caused a disaster. Um, but then there was a flurry of dam building on the Colorado, uh, in Arizona, the Salt River Project was brought into being. And I grew up right near the Salt River Project, near Papago Mountain, um, right near the Salt River Project, which came into being to build Ro the Roosevelt Dam. And the Roosevelt Dam uh, was constructed between 1904 and 1911. Um, and it was the largest dam of its time, I think. It was 280 feet. Um, and uh, Arizona, by the way, was made a state in 1912. And then so we have that dam, and then under uh, FDR, we get the age of gigantism, the building of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, the Empire State Building is completed in 1933 as the world's tallest skyscraper. Um, we get all this gigantism, including Hoover Dam, which now is 726 feet, uh, and it's built way up north, dams up the Colorado, dries up the Salt River, uh, which is an empty riverbed, and the Salt River, which turns into the Gila, the Salt River flows sort of horizontally from east to west. And it, too, brought in the riverine civilization of the Hohokam. The Hohokam, along with the Anasazi at the Four Corners and the Mugian in New Mexico and Mexico, are the three great uh, cultural amoebae of the southwest. And when the drought hit around 1300 AD and the Salt River dried up, it killed off the Hohokam. We had a rather complex civilization with a very complicated system of canals uh, that were resurrected by uh, the people who settled Phoenix in the 1860s and, and 70s. Um, so these water anxiety is a big deal here. So now with the Glanton gang, they're moving north uh, up toward Tucson now, and they pass the mission of uh, San Javier uh, de Bac. They pass that. And as they're going along, the first thing that happens in, in this chapter now, in chapter 16, is that uh, James Miller's horse is attacked by a wild bull. 
a wild bull gores it, lifts his horse up into the air and knocks him off. He's unhurt, but he's mad. And Frederick Remington, who is the great artist of cowboy art, let's say, or, or of Southwestern art, um, plenty of his illustrations would fit perfectly uh, to illustrate Blood Meridian, has a painting showing a buffalo goring a horse uh, with a, a Native American flying off the, the horse. Um, so that happens, and then they're going along, and then they find their scouts. They had sent ahead some scouts. The, the remaining Delaware, the one who had had to club to death, the other two Delaware who were wounded, um, he uh, was sent along, along with Gilchrist and the Van Diemen Lander, and here they come across a Palo Verde tree where all three of these guys are hanging upside down like an upside down crucifixion, uh, kind of like Peter was crucified upside down. So they're hanging upside down with their uh, entrails, their, their guts slit with flint and entrails hanging out. So they see this and they know it's a bad omen. Uh, they're supposed to be hunting Apache, but they no longer really have the strength uh, to do so. And they come upon the outskirts of Tucson then, where they meet a gang of uh, Chiroqua Apache. Um, they no longer have the strength to attack them. They don't even bother. Um, and they come across, the, the, their leader is Mangus Colorado, whose Indian name is Red Sleeve, actually. He's based on a historical character. He's a real character. Um, so they meet him, and one of the horses then uh, bites the ear off of one of the Apache's horses. And blood is squirting out. Um, so it's a major offense. Um, it doesn't cause a battle, but Mangus Colorado tells Glanton and the judge, you have to pay for this in whiskey. We need whiskey. And they say, we're out of whiskey. We don't have any. And he says, go into the town and get some. That's the debt that you owe us or else. So now they can't even fight the Apache. Now they're, they're scared of them, actually, because the Apache will end up massacring them if they don't pay this debt. Uh, so they go into the town of Tucson, and they're in there. And they're looking for new recruits, uh, and they find this guy named Clois Bell, uh, who wants to go to California, um, but he has uh, his brother. His brother uh, is apparently an imbecile who lives in a cage made of Palo Verde wood um, that he puts on show as a wild man for two bits for people to, to come and see. And um, Glanton asks him, so what are you going to do with that? And he says, well, we'll take it with us, uh, and I'll pay you $100 to take me to California. Um, and back then, a, a dollar in 1850 was worth about $33 today. So he's willing, $100 is about $3,300 is what he's willing to pay them to take him to California. And they say, okay, and we'll drag your imbecile brother on a cart behind us. Um, this is almost like a cross between a Sam Peckinpah film and a Fellini film. Uh, McCarthy's imagination is just absolutely uh, inexhaustible. Uh, so then they're looking for, for drink. So they go into an eating house, and they all sit down. Uh, and the guy who is the owner of the eating house, his name is Owens, and he says, uh, we'll serve the black man, but he has to sit at a different table. This is the black Jackson. He has to sit at a different table. And Glanton and the judge look up to him, and they say, we're not moving anywhere. No one's moving from this group anywhere. Um, and he says, well, I'm sorry, then I, I can't serve you. Um, and one of them says, do you have a gun? And Owen says, no, I don't have a gun. So they throw him a gun and they say, go ahead and shoot him. Uh, and he doesn't seem to know what to do with the gun. But meanwhile, Black Jackson simply fires his gun, uh, uses his left hand to hammer it down and shoots the guy through the head. His head explodes, basically. Um, and so now there's no one to serve them, so they have to serve themselves. And they bring in a big pail of whiskey and put it on the table that they siphoned off from the bar. So now they have the whiskey uh, that they owe the Apache. So they're there on the bar, and they offer Cloyce Bell to come and drink from it, and he drinks from it reluctantly. Um, and so that's the episode in the eating house. And then they go out into the town uh, for more craziness. Each one of these chapters ends with them in a town uh, engaging in a Dionysian bacchanalia, basically. And so they go out uh, into the town, and uh, again, a bonfire, and a bunch of their men are running around naked, 
uh, and it's just craziness. Uh, and then a guy approaches them who has three different types of mutant dogs. And one of the dogs has six legs. Another one of his dogs has two legs. And another one of his dogs has four eyes. <laughs> and he's offering them for, for sale. And uh, Glanton tells him to just fuck off. Um, this is, of course, possibly a, revel a, a book a reference to the book of Revelation, where we have the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, uh, a, a magnifying the seven powers of God out into the world. But here, these are animals. These are infernal animals. They're monsters. Uh, this is a hellish world. This isn't the power of God. This, this is the power of hell. And to cement that fact, then, in the next paragraph, we have the judge now playing a fiddle. Um, the judge plays the fiddle, just as I had compared him er earlier to Mananan McLear, who was also a master of the harp. Um, but here, there's a tradition that the devil plays the fiddle. Uh, if you recall the Charlie Daniels song, The Devil Went Down to Georgia from 1979, uh, to engage in a, in a fiddle contest with another guy, and he, and he loses, and the guy wins a gold fiddle. And then that's reworked in the 1986 Ralph Macchio film called Crossroads, uh, where, the, where it switches to electric guitars, and the guy has to play a contest with the devil uh, using electric guitars. But the tradition is that the, the devil plays the fiddle, uh, and uh, Judge Holden plays the fiddle. And in one of the last scenes of the book, he plays the fiddle as well. So we're in hell here. And uh, Judge Holden is clearly a variation of, of the devil. Then we get this last paragraph in this chapter with the blacksmith. He's called a farrier, but the farrier is a, it's a type of blacksmith where he has this meteorite. And this is apparently based, according to John Seppich, on a real meteorite that a blacksmith was using as an anvil. Uh, and so it's a kind of a U-shaped meteorite, uh, iron bearing, that he's been using as a ham uh, an anvil. Uh, and several of the people make a wager to see if the judge can lift it. And he can. He lifts it up uh, atop his head and holds it up. Like Atlas, note, holding up the globe of the earth above his head. So he holds it up. Um, and then they wager him to see if he can throw it. And uh, they draw a line in the sand and see if he can throw it. And, of course, he throws it past the line by about a foot, wins a bunch of money uh, that he doesn't share with anyone else. Of course, these men are all greedy and they're all self-interested. Nobody's going to share anything with anyone. Um, and that's it. So, once again, a reference to the mineralogical realm here, the metallurgy, mineralogy. Um, this is the realm of uh, copper and gold and silver and mining and metallurgy. As uh, And all the metaphors are elemental. Then we have the two rivers, the Rio Grande, and especially the Colorado, and the anxiety over water shortage. Uh, so these are the elemental realm that McCarthy is dealing with in this novel. So that's, that brings us up to chapter 16.